Would everyone quickly be able to mute themselves, by the way, just to avoid any feedback? Mr. Hutchinson, are you able to? Ah, oh, wonderful. Wonderful. Thank you. Thank you. Okay, we are live, Chair. Thank you, Henry. Good evening and welcome to the virtual South of the Borough Neighbourhood Committee meeting. I'm sorry, Mr. Hutchinson, apologies. Would you mind putting yourself on mute? I think you must have come off. Sorry, I've got to get feedback. Thank you very much. Um, sorry. Will do. Oh, no. Thank you very much. I'll start again. Thank you. Good evening and welcome to the virtual South of the Borough Neighbourhood Committee meeting and welcome to those members of the public watching on the Council's YouTube channel. My name is Councillor Lorraine Dunstone and I'm chairing the meeting this evening. Uh, so if we can start with everyone present in the meeting ensuring their mobile phones are switched off or in silent mode for the duration of the meeting. Um, this meeting is being broadcast live on the Council's YouTube channel. A copy of the recording will be available on the channel shortly after this meeting. Members and officers are reminded to keep their microphones on mute unless they are called to speak. Members can indicate that they wish to speak by typing their name in the chat function. Please do not use the chat function to ask questions of officers or councillors because they will not be answered as the chat stream cannot be seen on the public broadcast. We will also have a number of officers present this evening whose cameras are switched off unless invited to advise the committee on issues before it. I will now introduce the councillors who are all voting members of this meeting. So if you wouldn't mind um, indicating your presence, I'll just do a quick roll call. So, um, Councillor Stephanie Archer. Good evening, everyone. Good evening. Councillor Dennis Goodship. Good evening, everyone. Good evening. Councillor Andreas Kirsch. Hi, good evening. Good evening. Councillor Christine Stewart. Good evening, everybody. Good evening. Councillor Margaret Thompson. Can you just quickly unmute yourself? Sorry, we didn't quite catch that. Good evening, everybody. Good, Thank good you. evening. Councillor Tai Tai Lan. Good evening, everyone. Good evening. And Councillor Sharon Young. Hello and good evening. Good evening. We have officers in attendance this evening who will present reports and answer questions from the committee during the meeting. We also have democratic services and IT officers in attendance. Their cameras and microphones will be off unless asked to called upon to speak on matters other than the provision of procedural advice. So we thought it'd be quite nice to um, invite, um, first of all, Christians Against Poverty, who the um, committee um, were able to grant an application um, towards uh, back in November. Um, so we invited along this evening Phil Hutchinson and um, his colleague Gail, um, and we thought it'd be quite nice to have an update of where the funds were spent. So um, good evening, Mr. Hutchinson. I hope you're well. Um, and uh, yes, if you'd like to let us know where the funding went towards, that would be really good. Thank you. OK, thank you. Thank you. Thank you for inviting us. And thank you for letting us go first, because Gail and I both have another meeting at eight o'clock. So uh, that was rather handy. Thank you. You asked if I was well. Forgive me if I sound um, funny, I, I suffer from something called late onset A um, fever, which doesn't mean it comes on in the evening. It means it came on late in life and I've got a particularly bad dose of it today. So hopefully the antihistamines will kick in. But if I start sneezing, Gail, you'll have to take over. OK, uh, <laughs> right. Well, thank you again for the, for the money you gave us. You, you actually gave us two doses. Uh, the first one was back in February to increase the work we do in south of the borough. And the second one was, as said, in November, uh, mainly to increase Gail's hours so that we can now take 50% more clients than we did before. Um, and in fact, Gail, on January the 1st, Gail started for working three, three, three days a week instead of two. And as you'll hear, um, it, it's becoming to be very much needed. Um, Within a month of getting that first tranche of money, the first lockdown started, and that changed the way in which we worked. 
Uh, normally, Gail would go and visit people in their houses and she would take somebody from a local church with her. And then as Gail moves on to other clients, that person, I'm sorry, some of you may remember what we said last time, that person would stay in touch with the client uh, um, and check they were okay, um, check they were keeping up the necessary financial things they had to do. Maybe take them out for a coffee, you know, just, just keep them cheerful because many of these people are in dire straits, not only financially, but it affects whatever else they do. So now uh, face-to-face -face meetings aren't allowed. So a lot of it's going on on the phone or the internet. So the chance of somebody from a local church going and physically meeting this person has uh, declined somewhat, but that doesn't mean we haven't been getting on with what you gave us the money for. There are eight churches in the south of the borough neighborhood all of them get our regular newsletter but in spite of the pandemic six of them have been contacted directly in the lockdown lull we've managed to meet with some of the church representatives uh, we've got we've got one that we haven't yet managed to physically meet with it was arranged but lockdown number two came in a couple of days later so we'll be catching up with that when when things return to normal, as we all hope they do. Some of them have actually got people supporting our clients by keeping in touch with them on the phone. Uh, one church we've negotiated with, St George's in Tolworth, when the lockdown ends and things are back to normal, we'll be running a monthly drop-in session there for people in financial difficulty. We're going to run it alongside their food bank. Um, and as I say, we'll be catching up with, with churches that we haven't yet managed to, to contact. Um, in terms of the clients that we get, you may know this, but there's been a moratorium on evictions uh, and on chasing debt. And as a result, there was a national drop off in the number of people ringing CAPS helpline. Now, we found that here as well that we had less clients coming through but we are expecting a huge influx when that moratorium ends that was the reason we wanted to take gail on for three days rather than two and in fact we're actually seeing an increase already as some people's hours are being cut as furlough schemes are looking in, um, increasingly difficult to keep going um and so we have, in the last three weeks, had more clients coming through than we have in the past few months, many of whom are in the south of the neighbourhood, but of course we operate all over, all over Kingston. Now, we've improved working with other help agencies in the last year. So we always work well with the food bank, but we've, we've added to the way we do that. So the food bank are now um, directing people our way in a way they didn't use to do um, so we're getting more clients coming through from them um, we've also had the department for working and pensions sending people our way and in fact i think gail gail's got a special session tomorrow afternoon or thursday gail will tell you at the end um, with cap headquarters with a few other debt center managers about um, how to deal with the dwp that sounds awful how to cooperate with the DWP um, and the way in which they are going to refer clients our way. One of the other things the food bank has done is given us emergency food boxes because a lot of our clients, when they first ring, they have no food in the house and they have no money to get food. And we often have to do emergency shops for them. Uh, this meant that we had down at St. John's, the partner church with, with Cap Head Office, we have now got a stack of food boxes with long life food in. And so in an emergency, one of us can just nip down to the church, grab it and take it out to somebody. And in fact, we've only just started this, but more than half of the, these food boxes we've delivered have gone to people in the south of the borough, which shows where the need really is, as we expected all along. We try to help in other ways. Uh, in the south of the borough, we've got uh, two children we're providing school uniforms for, and we're also trying to get furniture for one of our clients. Um, I think this is probably because St. John's Church, being the partner church, is actually in the Norbiton ward, but all three Norbiton councillors will occasionally ring and say, we've got a client moving into a council property. 
there is no furniture in there. Is there anything you can do to help? Well, it's not what we normally do, but we've got a few contacts we can quickly get in touch with and try and pull things together. So we do help in other, other ways as well. We haven't spent the money quite yet in the way we want to due to the pandemic, but we do fully intend when things are back to normal to follow up on all the contacts we've made, to meet with churches personally, to get that scheme that we call befrienders of somebody going with Gail when they meet a client so that there's somebody there to properly follow up with them rather than do it all on the phone. Um, we've also in trying to reach more people. Uh, we've, we've used some money to advertise on Radio Jackie. We were a little surprised that we had to pay we thought as a charity it might be free but there are some strange rules we found uh, that cover advertising on radio um we also get regular plugs believe it or not on kingston hospital radio that's a combination of gail having a bright idea and me having a friend who dj's there on a monday night but every bit of publicity will help us and we are we are having banners made to be displayed at the six food bank outlets so that as well as the food bank referring people, people who go to food banks are aware uh, that CAP exists. And often going to the food bank is the first step some of the people make to getting help. And if you've made that first step, it's easier to make the second step. Um, and, and at the moment, outlet, uh, referrals are coming in from various places, doctors, churches, the food banks, so the Department for Work and Pensions. That is the nutshell version of what we do. We're very grateful for it because it has enabled us to expand. It's enabled us to contact more churches in Chessington because the first transfer money gave, gave a bit of extra time. Now we've got it for an extra day. So instead of four clients a month, we're now able to take up to six clients a month. And if you'd like to know what it means to a client, today, Gail got uh, rang a new client to set up the first meeting the client said that she had no money uh, to buy food and no food in the house. Gail had meetings all day, so rang around to see if she could get somebody to take an emergency food box, which I happened to be free at that time, so I did it. And Gail, just want Gail to read you a message that she's had today. Is that okay? Hey then, Gail. Yep, please do. <laughs> oh, thanks. Um, she just said, um, yeah, thank you so much for the food parcel, so kind. I look forward to Sorry, my phone's gone off. Uh, yeah, I look forward to um, speaking soon. Through CAP, a great weight is being lifted from my shoulders. I'm so glad I contacted you. God bless you all, and many thanks for the delivery of food. <laughs> oh, <laughs> and I think it's just, yeah, just people are just so grateful. And, um, yeah, people sort of on the verge of, like, breakdowns, with you know, suffering with anxiety and stress and just to know that people are walking alongside them yeah it just really means a lot so yeah thank you so much so, to both of you um, please. Your hard work. sorry philip did you, Phil, did you want to come back in thank you please please know that you're, sorry i was going to say please know that your money really does help people um you know, it's helped us work in the Chessington and the south of the borough neighbourhood. The second tranche is helping us reach more people. But the story we hear time and time again is the moment they were in cap, that way, like that lady said in the message, the weight is lifted from their shoulders because they don't have to deal with, with them, you know, the debt collectors anymore or the phone calls. That's now done from cap head office and the pressure's off. So thank you very, very much. Thank you so much for coming along this evening. Um, it's really wonderful to hear um, where the money goes to and um, to get an update and, and particularly on the fantastic work that you guys have been doing. Um, and um, I know with regards to the, the food bank in Tolworth, your attendance at the, the monthly um, drop-in centres um, will be very, well, greatly valuable. I know it's, it's difficult enough for people to go and seek help. Um, so for you to be there when they need it at the at the worst, then it's it's um, absolutely wonderful. I know you need to go off for a meeting at eight, but just quickly, did anyone else have, have a question or a comment that they would um, like to come in on? Um, 
Can I ask a quick question? Thank you. Okay, great. Uh, absolutely brilliant. Really lovely uh, hearing how the money's been spent. Um, just really interested about what the last thing you said, because I don't actually think I know um, that much about CAP, um, but the fact that they then take on the, the responsibility of kind of um, those phone calls and the, the, I guess, is it the bailiffs coming and things like that. That just sounds um, just absolutely fantastic. Can you tell us just a bit more about what that looks like then in terms of weight, like lifting the burden from the client? Sure. Yeah, so, Gail, do you want to do that? Okay, yeah. So CAP, um, when the client um, uh, agrees to work with CAP, then, um, yeah, they give CAP authority to speak on their behalf. So, um, yeah, so like the creditors will then deal with CAP. Um, and I think CAP, I mean, they can't call off enforcement, but they, they will walk through uh, that process with the client so they know that they don't have to open the door and they can have them on the other end of the phone if need be to reassure them and to help them. So, yeah, so they are there as <laughs> providing support and, and guidance. Um, yeah, so we've had like clients who've been um, like in the system for quite a while and it's taken them some time to resolve the situation. Um, but even they've been working with them for two or three years. <laughs> and um, yeah, so it's just, yeah, just helping them just to keep on track to, to make sure that if they're having to pay into a plan or uh, if they're going through an insolvency route, just, yeah, knowing that they've got help there. Thank you. Sharon, did you want to come in? I would just echo what's already been said, actually. Thank you so much for, for sharing your work. It's really nice to hear um, firsthand how residents are, are benefiting. Um, and like Steph, I was really impressed that there's a, a consultation line or a support line because often dealing with the DWP and getting passed from person to person and having to retell their stories again and again is really difficult, especially when you don't have Wi-Fi or connection on your phone and having to wait and, and talk to someone new each time. So um, I really appreciate that. Thank you to you. Chris, did you want to come in? Yeah, Phil, thanks very much for that presentation. Um, how many people do you actually have working so they can work individually with clients? That's, that's an interesting question. At the moment, Gail is the only, because there's a huge training scheme, Gail is the only person qualified to actually do the initial work we have another lady joining us who is going to be with us for a year for free. Um, she is starting in me late March, I think, um, and she's going she's gonna to work with us for a year. So she will be trained. That will make it easier for us to reach more people. And then in the next couple of days, we are hoping to appoint somebody else for an extra day, but it's not going to cost anything. This is a guy who's just retired who wants to volunteer to do that as well. Then we've got about, correct me if I'm wrong, Gail, we've got about 12 people from different churches at the moment with more online to cut to join us uh, to befriend the people and take them further on. But the first three meetings, a qualified debt coach such as Gail has to be there. Um, yeah, just to say with the DWP, it's um, it would be for us to have like a ring back service for yeah for people for clients um, if they agree, uh, then they can uh, call we have a call with us so they get a referral then because all the referrals will come through the helpline so, and the idea is like the befrienders yeah to um, yeah just to support the client so um, yeah today I had like a befriender was. Um, yeah, called a client because her children needed school uniform. So, it, yeah, and she was just, you know, was just getting details for me for that. And, yeah, just, yeah, providing a bit of extra help, really. So, yeah, they're brilliant. <laughs> could, I, could I just ask a question myself? And this isn't to stop any of you asking more questions, but we don't often use Google for this. We use Zoom. So when we do leave, if somebody could tell me how to leave, that would be brilliant. You should have a little uh, red phone in the bottom of the centre of your screen that you can 
just hang up on yeah. if it's there um and we will let you go now thank um, you. Get, have a cup go and have, grab a cup of tea before your next meeting so thank you so much again um we really appreciate you coming along and uh giving us an update that's wonderful thank you oh thank you thank bye. you thank you bye thank you bye bye that was wonderful um so um i i understand i'm not sure that um uh, Sergeant Swan has been able to attend this evening. He was hoping to, to be here, um, but I can't see him in the meeting. Is that correct, Henry? Yes, we're just trying to chase him up but at the moment. He's currently not, not in the meeting. Okay, all right. Well, we'll move on. And if he manages to join us, hopefully he'll be able to give us an update at that point. So we'll go on to item three, which is public questions. And unfortunately, we don't have any public questions this evening. Um, and we'll, the next item is petitions, and I've not received notification of any petitions um, that qualify for submission this evening. So if we can go on to apologies for our absence, item five. Um, do we have any apologies? Uh, I've not received any apologies, Chair. Okay, thank you. Um, so declarations of interest. Um, members are asked to declare any disclosable pecuniary interests and any other non-pecuniary interests, i.e. personal interests, uh, relevant to items on the agenda. Do members have any declarations of interest? And if so, if you could use the chat function and I'll call you to speak. Okay, so that seems fine. Thank you very much, members. Um, so on to minutes. Are there any objections to approving the minutes of the meeting of the South of Borough Neighbourhood uh, Committee held on the 12th of January uh, 2021 as a correct record of the meeting? Everyone okay? Okay, I'll sign them at a later date. Thank you. Now, I know um, Richard's having a few issues with his connection tonight. Um, so I'll, I will see if he's, oh, he's, yeah, to come up. Um, so if I pass over to um, Richard for the Neighbourhood Manager's uh, report. Thank you, Richard. Good evening, uh, Chair, Vice Chair members and uh, members of the public. Yes, um, I've been in and out like the hokey cokey there, haven't I? So I do apologise. Let's see what the uh, signal goes for, for this, re this report. So... Um, Right, so uh, as ever, it seems at the moment, though we are, of course, as we say, getting to the end, my uh, report always starts with a little coronavirus update. Uh, and it's it's really sort of good news, I think. We, we've, we've got a small and collectively uh, Kingston country, our neighbourhood pat ourselves on the back. Um, infection rates across the borough, uh, I've just looked on the certain website run by the BBC, and um, we're looking at 45 per 100,000 for the latest week going up to the 5th of March with a, an, an average across England of 50. And you, when you take only a few weeks ago where we were, that's a, a significant, significant um, reduction. So so thank you everyone for helping. We mustn't forget, of course, um, statistically one in three people with COVID-19 have no symptoms though. And with children as, uh, heading back to school now, as I heard your uh, chat before the, before the meeting started, Chair, it's more important than ever that we try and find positive cases and keep infections as low as possible so that we can all obviously get back to whatever normal looks like at the earliest opportunity. There is, and they crop up all over the place, but I'm sure people know there's a, a new walk-in coronavirus testing facility that's opened for those with symptoms at the Hawker Centre in Kingston that will be open from eight to eight. But the important message, of course, is anyone with any symptoms should book an appointment immediately via the NHS website or by calling 119. Sterling efforts though, I mean, as of a few days ago, we're, we're over 20 million people, aren't we, that are um, vaccinated, received the first first vaccine. And, and now we're down to the, the, the just below the 60s, the 56 to 60s, and people uh, who are registered with learning disabilities. And if you don't know where in the system you might be around getting a vaccine, just, just go to the coronavirus website run by the NHS and if you put your details in it will just tell you whether you you're entitled in this current tranche to uh, be injected or not. Um, right moving off of coronavirus just a, a little thing that happens every every 10 years called the census and that's uh, that's around as we know to be completed by the 21st of March uh, and as it says here th this is the opportunity to tell everyone 
um, who's in your house, what your needs are. And um, so fill it in as uh, as soon as you possibly can on or after the 21st of March. My understanding is that that's, that's the day and you shouldn't do it before. So the lead on in, in the number of people in your household, uh, et cetera, is about nursery spaces, school spaces uh, and social provision. So it's really, really important that you fill it in uh, correctly. Uh, Kingston Heritage Service uh, are asking residents actually to, re to record their experiences of the pandemic within the borough with them and donate any items they may wish to the history centre. So quite excitingly, uh, your personal record, a diary or journal, photographs, any, any sort of evidence of the way we've all dealt with the impact of lockdown uh, could actually form part of an exhibition, which I think is really exciting to be honest with you. Um, for those that do wanna uh, take part in such a thing, kingstonheritage.org.uk. Uh, so it's kingstonheritage.org.uk. And I will, as ever, let Henry have a copy of this uh, report post meeting so that um, so that the, the web addresses are published and on there for everyone. Now, uh, next item, I, I am jumping all over the place, but an item I never thought I might be talking about is um, a public toilet access strategy. So uh, a Kingston Let's Talk uh, consultation is going on at this moment can be accessed via the portal kingston let's talk dot co dot uk and it asks for community thoughts on where public facilities should be positioned to the aid of the borough um actually quite a quite a big and important subject to be honest with you uh chair vice chair and members uh, especially you know that i've been i've been trying to do some some marvelous things with uh, technology around the community infrastructure levy and it seems i've struggled to actually log on with any sort of decent success tonight that that you can understand why maybe the end it uh, hasn't come to fruition but um just just for everyone watching the, the community infrastructure levy is a uh, is, is an amount of money that's raised via um, effectively is a, is a tax, if you like, from the London Mayor and local authorities on new housing development shops and hotels. And by doing a little tiny bit of digging around recently, we found out we've, we've not got the minuscule amount of money that we thought we had um, as a result of the com community infrastructure levy to decide on spend at a local level we, we originally thought it was about 14 one four thousand but um we've got just over a hundred and fifty thousand pounds which is which is excellent news but we really really do need uh, the community's views on where they feel it's important to spend the money in the south of the borough three wards so tolworth and hook rise chessington north and hook and chessington south now i'd think if things have gone properly i'll be able to um give you a link to a map where you could just literally pin a a, a little place on a map close to you it would come up with a dialogue box and um you could put in what project you wanted and, and who you wanted to help with the project but that's going to take another few weeks to get online so what i would say in lieu of this um this solution, we will get it online. Anyone who's interested in accessing community infrastructure levy funding, look at the look at the Kingston Council website, and then on the front page, there's a section called Community Grants. Click on that and then go to Communities, Neighbourhoods and Community Safety, and there's a little section Community Grants. Now, as with everything, there are certain things, community infrastructure levy can only be spent on community infrastructure but that's there's quite a, a remit of things really from community allotments to defibrillators to pathways in parks and local priorities that are linked to our community plans now if we remember pre-covid um best part of 18 months ago now we did a lot of consultation and asked people what was important for them in, in south of the borough in fact we did it all over the, the um the borough but specifically for me south of the borough and the, and the green spaces air quality of course that those come up and that's what we wanted to use and what we will use the the mapping information for as well but please if if you're out there and you're thinking i've really got a great project and i really want someone to look at it to see if it fits the community infrastructure guidelines go onto that website fill in an initial little um inquiry form and we'll get back to you or if all else fails just email me richard.dean at kingston.gov.uk so it's richard.dean at kingston.gov.uk so chair members and members of the public that's uh, that's my droning for the first session
Thank you very much, Richard. Um, I just wanted just to um, clarify on the um, census. Um, you are al allowed to fill it in before the 21st of March. Um, so just uh, if you go online, you can. Uh, you are actually allowed to do that. So uh, yeah, just for clarity. Um, Thank you. Uh, yeah. That, <laughs> sorry. <laughs> okay. Did anyone have any questions for Richard at all? No. You've got away Scott free on that one. Thank you very much for that update, Richard. Um, and so we'll go over to um, community grants and I will pass it back to, to you, Richard, for to present the report. Thank you. Yes, thank you very much, uh, Chair members and member of the public, members of the public. I have um, the pleasure of offering two community grant applications this evening, uh, one from Chessington and Hook. United Football Club and um, I think it's the secretary, Lauren Preston and Andrew Ellis, who seems to be the first team coach for just about every team run by the, uh, by, by the, by the team there. And um, a second application from uh, Yorda Adventures and uh, Laura Smith is here to answer questions on that. So on behalf of the, the applicants, thank you very much for, for um, coming to answer the questions. You'll be far better at answering them than I. So, um, so the first, uh, first application we'll deal with is for the grant of £3,000 for Chessington and Hook United Football Club. And this is to contribute to a roof repair on, on the clubhouse. My general understanding is that roofs are not in best order uh, there, but they need to start with a clubhouse. So they've got a safe environment for the age groups from four to 144 that, that take part in uh, activities there. Um, as I always say, uh, Chair, Vice Chair, Members, um, the, the presumption you may have from the minimum standards box filled in with the whys is that all the minimum standards in respect of uh, finance and due diligence have been completed, reviewed by an officer and are deemed to be correct and in good order for this to go forward. So, um, as I say, the football club have submitted a grant for £3,000 to assist with a project to replace a leaking clubhouse roof. So far, my belief, or certainly was, that there were three quotes uh, to undertake the work, ranging from just over £7,500 to £9,000. If successful, the neighbourhood grant uh, would, of course, only provide part payment uh, and additional funding as we go towards hopefully what normality will come in, in a few in a few weeks and months time will be sourced via uh, the old traditional fundraising football tournaments um cake bake sales you, you name it anyone in the club will will be be raising money and obviously we've got to put a, a little bit of a life scale lifetime span on a grant so what we've come to an agreement that if a if the grant is is permitted in full or part of the repair section the repair if you like to that section of the roof would, would have to be completed or substantially completed within um within 12 months of the funds being allocated to the committee this by the committee this evening so chessington and hook football club are known to me when i when i when i look them up I've got a re really rich history being formed in, in something like 1921, which make them mildly older than me even. Um, uh, and astonishingly, they run four, a total of 14 sides at the moment, from literally the four-year-olds to um, a couple of adult sides. There are about 250 people at the latest count, I think, registered with the club. And, and please, representatives of the club, feel free to contradict and come in with anything I might get wrong there. And the youngest players... Uh, the club start at, at four years old in, in a little shooter's squad. And the aims and objectives are really what we like at a sport, I think. They're based around enjoyment, participation, uh, and all that sport stuff done in a real safe and fun environment. And that's that's sort of how we get the young ones into sport, isn't it? Uh, as I said, all age ranges are, are represented in the club it, it, through the squads up to um, under 18s and under 21s bridging the gaps between the youth and the adult um, squads. Participation fraud is encouraged at the club and the overall aims and ambitions being centred around participation sport, obviously physical fitness, reducing isolation and improving the opportunities for those who are engaged at whatever level they are in the club. 
And again, and I always bang on about this one, Chair, so please please excuse me, but um, it's not mentioned specifically in the application again, but I'd just like to point out that link between physical well-being uh, and mental health and well-being that happens uh, with sports and being around other people. As ever, I, I ask others for their views and not just say that it's a brilliant idea all by myself. And um, the kind people from the sports development team have, have come back to me and say they're fully supportive of um, the bid, adding that they're a very good club to support with a, with a good history. And um, furthermore, we can take offline afterwards, but the sport development officers have said that they can probably help with links to the other parts of the funding you might need um, via football foundation bids and stuff like that. So if you haven't gone down that process, we can probably help offline with that. So um, rather stutteringly done this evening, Chair, but that's my submission on behalf of um, Chester and the Hook United Football Club. Thank you, Richard. Um, does the committee have any questions at all for the applicant or for ri indeed Richard for this evening? Okay, if we go to uh, Ty and then Andreas. Ty. Thank you, Chair. Uh, congratulations on the, on the centenary year. Well done. It's a significant milestone. Um, my, my question is, um, uh, how much, what percentage of the 250 people are South Borough? And is it just for boys only or is it girls uh, teams as well? Thank you. Sorry, what was the last part of that question? Uh, whether it's just for boys only or it's a boys and girls team? We, we have tried so many times to get a girls team together and we have failed. We do have some girls that train and we do have some girls that play in the boys teams. So it's not solely boys football, but we've just struggled to get a girls side with enough players at one age group to play. So we've got girls ranging. So we've got one in our under 12s, one in our under 15s, believe it or not. She plays against all the boys at that age. We've got one in the 13s and I think one in the under 7s. Thank you. And uh, what percentage are South of Borough? <coughs> South of Borough? Um, we done it. We So we had to look at it on London Borough or Surrey. So if I, I've only got the figures on that, we've probably got about 70% in the London borough um, because we, when we was going through the COVID bits, at one point you couldn't travel between London and Surrey to play. So we had to tell children they couldn't play in games because they lived in Surrey and not in the London borough. Okay, thank you. But we have, just to let you know, we have just tied up with Chesington School an academy. So we are working really closely with Chesington School now as well. So we're doing an academy for there. So it'll be a sixth form academy where the children can do uh, the soccer at our football club and then obviously the schooling at the school. Thank you. Thank you. Andreas. Thank you, Chair, and uh, yeah, thank you, Andrew for, and Lauren, for coming tonight, and uh, congratulations to their, your sanitary as well, and thanks for all the great work you're doing with the uh, children and uh, um, and <clears throat> young people. So, and I'm, I'm very pleased to hear about the project with Chessington School, so that sounds really exciting. So, uh, I, I just wanted to uh, ask, so uh, if you could really briefly elaborate, obviously, the, the, the grant is for repairing the roof of the uh, clubhouse, and uh, everybody has their own guesses what you usually use a clubhouse for. But if you could just bit, uh, please elaborate a bit what activities you do uh, usually in uh, normal times. Obviously, at the moment, I know uh, from, from conversations with you guys, it was tricky for you the last past year. So and hopefully you can go back to, to do more with the children uh, uh, soon again. Uh, but just in normal times, what, what are you offering at a clubhouse? Normally, we see we have to have a clubhouse because our first team play in senior football. So our first team play in the FA Vars. We're not in the FA Cup. We need to be one level above really to be play FA Cup. So we have to have a clubhouse, certain facilities around the ground to use. But the clubhouse used for functions, um, the, the end of season presentation, um, 
after dinner. So you have dinner after the game and drinks after a first team game, which are all sponsored. Um, and that's what we use the clubhouse for. Obviously, the toilets as well, bar refreshments. We don't do functions anymore um, with the amount of damage that you get at a function. There's really no point, I'm afraid. Yeah, thanks. Thank you, Andrew. And keep up the good work. Yeah, we, we just have yeah. actually just finished two Zoom calls this evening with the kids. <laughs> well Brilliant. done. Anyone else like to come in? Okay. Um, so um, I will. Uh, so can we agree on a grant amount uh, for the application of three thousand pounds? I will move this from the chair. Do I have a second of that, please? Oh, there's lots of Margaret. Thank you very much, Councillor Thompson. Um, so can I take the agreement from the grant application as unanimous? Um, if you please indicate in the chat function if you wish to go to a vote. <clears throat> okay, so um, that's unanimous. So the uh, motion is agreed. So um, thank you very much for coming along and thank you for applying for the grant and uh, keep up the good work. It's amazing to see um, and hear all the, all, all the good news. So, so well done. Thank you. Uh, you can leave the meeting now if you wish or you can continue to yep. watch it on YouTube. <laughs> Lovely. Thank you very much. Thanks for your time. Okay. Thank you very much, Bye. guys. Thanks. Thank you. Bye bye. OK, so um, I will pass back to Richard, if that's OK. So, um, we've got another grant application from Yorder Adventures. So thank you, Richard. Thank you, Chair. Um, yes, Yorder Adventures Nature and Crafts Workshop for Women have uh, Yorder Adventures have submitted a neighbour grant application for £3,000 to enable uh, a nature and craft workshop aimed primarily to support women in the community in this particular case and it will become obvious as I, as I come come down. The aim of the pro project is to encourage women in the community mainly not not uniquely but mainly women in the community possibly a parent of the, of the attendees at Yorda of course to engage in a way that will offer a chance to rebuild their confidence improve their mental health and well-being and learn new skills using the calming influences of a nature-based program. Reference in the application we received to a UN report highlights the dip, disproportionate impact of the COVID pandemic on women, actually, who are often the main providers of childcare, um, homeschooling and care for other family members. And obviously taken in the order context, this is, this is even more so. By undertaking this and other unpaid work, of course, women find themselves sometimes uh, unable to mix and an, an increased feeling of um, an element of isolation within the community. And if unchecked, as we know, this can lead to ongoing medical cases of, of depression and other illnesses. If granted, Yorda would be able to provide uh, at least 12 participants with a six week work week, a six week programme to address these inequalities and work towards an improved sense of self-esteem uh, provide them with an opportunity for forging new connections and developing new skills within the neighbourhood and community. The project will be open to all women uh, from all backgrounds, um, as, as well as any of those with any disabilities, of course. It's believed, I and mean, it's hard to tell, it's a little bit chicken and egg, isn't it? But it's, it's believed the majority of applicants of the course will be from south of the borough. Um, and I'll, I'll probably let Laura expand on that um, as the the people that are probably known to you already through through the work done locally um, via forest and send work forest activities of children who attend Lovelace Castle Hill and Toad Hall Nursery on Bridge Road for the information of, of the committee as well as the obvious personal benefits that participants will gain there's also the benefit that the project brings together wider community by teaching the participant ways of looking after it better understand nature around them and so to better protect it so there's a there's a payoff participants will will learn and teach us all how to um treat where we live a bit better and with a bit more respect one hopes um i won't mention dropping litter at this point of course that's not the subject of this meeting but um no i, I did go to colleagues in both achievement for children and the wider public health 
remit to come with a professional comment for on this application but as one can imagine they they are pretty covid stricken at this time and so um the the support i'm unfortunate for this one isn't from one of those wonderful paid professionals it'll have to come i'm sorry uh, laura for this it'll have to come from me um i, I think that um we all know the work that that you ought to do supporting children young families in our communities and those children some of them with very severe uh, disabilities um i think an opportunity to support those and to give some time and to give some um help to those parents locally for us it would be an excellent thing so Sorry, Laura, probably not as eloquently put as one of these marvellously paid professionals with letters after their name. Um, but I, I can commend the application to the committee and, and as ever, as we say at this point, um, it's fully looked through, it's fully costed. And I think I shared costs with uh, members on one of the emails. Um, thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you, Richard. And welcome tonight, Laura. And um, does, does any of the committee have any questions at all for, for Laura or for Richard, indeed? Can I, I'll go to Sharon and then Margaret, then Steph and then Chris. So if I Thank pass you, over Sharon. to Sharon. Um, Laura, I think that sounds a really interesting project, really exciting. Um, so well done. Um, can I just ask, how will you be inviting the women to participate? Will you be um, selecting them or will they ask or how, how will that happen? Of course. Good evening, everybody. Thanks so much for having me. Um, yes, it's been a sort of a growing need, this project. So it's very much you would be um, putting the kind of funding behind a pilot, something that we've been thinking about that has been needed for quite a long time. Um, so we put together a, a survey about this time last year um, asking and we had uh, 60 responses in the space of probably about two days all saying yes, please. Um, so in terms of the the cohort we're very mindful that we 12 participants per session is is very deliberate in order to make sure that they all get the most they can out of the session um, so initially being a pilot we would advertise it through our current networks which as um, Richard eloquently <laughs> told you all about was the um, through the total nursery which we work with on a weekly basis and have done um, through most of the the lockdowns where the EYFS and um, stuff has still been allowed to continue um, through um, our SEND uh, work that we do. So across all of our families with children with learning disabilities who currently attend the Playhouse for childcare for their child um, with a learning disability, um, but also we've started a new cohort. So for children who are not severe enough to meet our childcare criteria, we acknowledge that there's a growing number of young people across the whole of Kingston who really do need some additional support and additional activities so we've started a new send forest club um, and that has been increasingly oh, we, we were oversubscribed for that just in the February half term so that would be our initial target group of, um, of families as well as a, a public on our Facebook page which we have um, over a thousand um, people signed up to um, in, the in the local community so that would be our advertising and what we would hope to do is pilot two different sort of methods have have six participants come and hopefully try to sign them up for every session in the six um, the pilot of six and then we'd have another six places which would be open um, rotation and the idea would be that if you got one of the places on that on one week you couldn't apply to the next one so that it would allow for a lot more women to take part in the pilot and we could then be see the benefit analysis of whether or not you needed to take part from the whole six weeks and that gave you a lot more um, skills self-esteem building and just generally well-being um versus could they get the same sort of effect from one time taking part and that would hopefully then give us a lot more information and material for um being able to roll the program on beyond the first six weeks i hope that's <laughs> <answers your> question <laughs> councillor sharon <laughs> yeah thank you that was really really good thank you thank you I think I said Margaret next, did I? Yes, we said Margaret. Hi, Laura. Hi, 
Um, <laughs> how many? I think you answered actually. I just wondered how many women you were uh, hoping to hoping to uh, have on your course, and will it be face to face or will you start running it virtually? I'm, I can't see how you could run it virtually, really, given its nature and craft. But uh, just <laughs> just to find out, really. So when would you start it after lockdown? Yes, so we're hoping to start it as soon as the restrictions allow, but one of the reasons we deliberately designed this as the project that we came to you for was the fact that we would hope that with the outside nature of it, um, we would be able to, to roll it, um, even if restrictions sort of tip and turn as they have done over the last year, it would be something that hopefully, unless full lockdown is in in due process we would be able to keep it going because it wouldn't involve any indoor activity um, we've um, installed an external sink out the back of the playhouse so that people don't have to come inside to wash their hands they can do that before they even enter the forest space um, and then it would uh, we have um, designated toilet toilet areas so only that group use that one toilet so that helps with our isolation bubbles would mean that we needed to close that group down um, so we've Done everything we can to try and make it as COVID safe as possible to ensure that we could continue that and that would be um, one of the reasons we're asking for some support with the tools so that we could make it that you're not having to share as many as many items across the the session um, and yes so in total using sort of six re coming regularly and six places being flexible that could be 42 women um, in total in the first um, pilots of, of six sessions. Thank you very much indeed. Uh, when you say toilet area, you do mean a toilet and not a designated tree, I take it. <laughs> well, let's part of the first craft session, Margaret, in which case, <laughs> no, I do mean inside the playhouse. <laughs> Thank you, Margaret. OK, I think it was Steph next. Yes. Hello, Laura. Really lovely to see you. Um, yeah, my daughter doesn't. She's very much kind of alfresco type toilet visitor um i've also just been interrupted by another small person so i missed um are the women coming with their kiddies and is that kind of a key part of it in terms of their um sort of development of kind of self-esteem and kind of parenthood um I'm, I'm sure you've already said it but does the kiddie come along as well <laughs> No, it's the only project that we'd be running, which is child free. Um, mm -hmm. And that's mostly come from the fact that um, in our current forest sessions, although they are not send specific, anybody in the local community can come along to our forest adventures um, mm -hmm. for our children under five years old. Um, and what we found on this journey, which we've been doing for the last four years, is that ordinarily um, young people who like alfresco um, um, sensory nature of all kinds and um, the ones who do struggle to be in indoor environments they're very much drawn to the forest adventures mm -hmm. um, and that can often mean um, that a lot of the children are quite spirited in nature and often tend to be um, a lot more energetic than perhaps them their next door neighbor um, and that those parents are often really struggling with the amount of energy it takes to raise their child and this is without any type of learning disability although mm -hmm. we do find that a lot of the young people who the children who attend the community under five group sometimes do go on to have some form of diagnosis because of the fact that the sensory environment is really key to their um their well-being and the way that they develop so they might become Yorda children in a more special needs way further on down the line but initially under five there isn't any diagnosis or it's just the fact that they're quite um, highly energetic and what we found um one one parent in particular gave us a really good um sort of nod to how important this journey has been because um she came along with her two children and um was has been really really struggling with the capacity to care for them um and has a very very up and down relationship with um different services required to help support her and her children and and when her children were old enough to go to school, um, she came back to us as a volunteer because she found the therapeutic nature of having the time outside in the woodland space and doing a targeted activity where she could go away at the end of the day and say, I've made this. Um, that 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 
generated such a huge boost to her self-esteem. We've taken her on as a volunteer. She now helps other mothers um, in that session to get that same level of um, win at the end of each session. And we just saw that, that that journey that it's taken for every single Wednesday morning, how much of an impact that's had on her and ultimately her you know, children's lives. We wanted to find a way to recreate that. And we had a lot of mums coming to us and saying, I don't know how to use this tool. How do I use this tool? And they're questions that they couldn't, felt like they couldn't ask in other environments um, and saying actually my little boy really really loves to do drilling and hammering and I don't feel confident to support him doing that and in you know 2020 2021 we were like okay well we definitely still need to be addressing women being really empowered to use tools and feel confident with them and give them that kind of you can ask any question you like but you'll also have our female forest leader who's really really adept to being able to to help you go on that journey to be able to really feel that level of empowerment at the end. Fantastic, thank you. No problem. Chris. Yeah, thanks very much, Laura. That's been really interesting. It's been fascinating as a pilot program. How many people at Yorda do you have working leading this as opposed to being participators? Uh, so we will have our, our main um, forest leader and two um, members of staff or a volunteer, depending on um, uptake. So the idea would be we'd have sort of three of us um, and then the 12 um, women. So the idea we would be able to split them into smaller socially distanced groups um, out in our woodland space where they could be doing various different activities and working together to build something and um, putting together some cooking and um, cooking that on the campfire. Um, all of those different things would happen in smaller groups. So there would hopefully be one of us to maybe three or four um, participants at each session. I commend you greatly because coming out of COVID, a lot of people are going to need this type of support for their own mental well-being. So well done. Thank you. I think you're right. And it's one of the reasons that we really wanted to kickstart this year with this application, because we felt it was more important than ever to be addressing the fact that for so many people, they have been isolated, being 24 hours, seven trapped in their own houses looking after their children in to such an intense way that we will hopefully never experience ever again. Thank you. Um, Ty. Well, thank you, Chair. Um, my question has already been answered. Um, I'd just like to make a comment. Um, yeah, I've, I've visited uh, your lectures uh, um, a couple of times and uh, I've seen the work they do. It's, it's really an excellent uh, work and it's an amazing uh, project as well, uh, supporting um, the women who are carers, uh, particularly in this pandemic time um, with their mental health and well-being. So, uh, yeah, it's a very good project and uh, I, I support it. And uh, keep up the good work, Laura. Well done. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Ty. Andreas. Thank you, Chair. And uh, thanks, Laura, for coming tonight. And I really want to reiterate what Ty just said. Uh, so also my question is already answered and just want to comment. Uh, it's really great work you're doing and the project sounds really exciting. And uh, as you mentioned, it, it will be a pilot. I really hope uh, it will be a great success for you and for all, everyone uh, who is participating. And I really hope that from the pilot, you, you, you'll be able afterwards and uh, the conclusions you draw to, to keep on the good work and perhaps there it will be more uh, than just a pilot in the end. So fingers crossed. Thank you. We hope so. Thank you, Anne. Thank you. Um, so uh, can we agree on a grant amount for this application of £3,000? Um, I will move this from the chair. Do I have a seconder for that, please? Um, Councillor Young, thank you. Um, can I take the agreement for the grant application as unanimous or if you want to indicate in the chat function if you wish to go for a vote? Okay, so voting is unanimous. Um, so thank you so much for coming along, um, Laurie. Your enthusiasm is incredible and it's been really inspiring to hear from you this evening. Um, and uh, we hope we can 
bring you back at some point for you to to give us an an update on um how how it's all gone and um you know that would be just fantastic so thank you thank you everybody um and hopefully in non um lockdown times you'd all be very welcome at the playhouse for a cuppa um yeah. do you always feel like you can pop in and say hello we'd love to see you um and show you the work that we do and and what what we've got available for the community thank you you're welcome to leave um <laughs> and continue to watch on the youtube channel if you wish to so but thank you very much it's lovely to meet you So we'll go to um, item 10 colleagues, um, the LIP funding for 21-22 programme. Um, can I first check with the committee has seen the late material for this item published earlier today? Everyone see that? Okay, lovely. I will turn to Philip Loy then to introduce the item. Good evening, Philip. Good evening, Chair. Uh, good evening, everybody, councillors. Um, so uh, this LIP report is basically about the, the main core funding for highways and transport projects in the borough. Um, the LIP is the uh, means by which um, all London boroughs are funded for their uh, highways and transport schemes from Transport for London. Uh, and that's the way, uh, you know, th th through the London local government, the, the way the way funding works. Much much of our funding comes through Transport for London, uh, and this means that we have to, in submitting our bids for schemes, we have to demonstrate that we fulfil the uh, policy objectives of the Mayor's Transport Strategy, uh, and there'll be various um, criteria which TfL you know assesses our schemes, uh, and. It, 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 um, most of you will have heard of, uh, for example, healthy streets. Uh, so uh, our schemes will be assessed in accordance with how they fulfil various characteristics uh, or indicators, rather, of healthy streets, uh, such as um, um, you know the needs of pedestrians, walking, cycling, public transport, uh, and making the um, the, the, str the street space um, more amenable to. Uh, the, you know, to the general public. Um, the funding that uh, has been submitted um, is provisional. That means the list and the amounts are provisional. Uh, it, and also the the actual amount that Transport for London will actually eventually settle with uh, the borough uh, will very much depend on how much uh, TfL in turn agrees with the Department for Transport. So, um, so this is the the list that's. I don't know if you've seen it in the table. It's a provisional list, um, and our, our aim tonight is to agree or and also prioritise the schemes for south of the borough, uh, and so we can feed that back, so that if if there's any funding shortfall, we can we know which schemes we want we want to prioritise. Um, so I'm just. Uh, just going through my notes here. Bear with me. Um, yes, so it, it, it's it's a, prov a provisional list, a provisional amounts uh, yet to be uh, decided. Uh, the, the the actual amounts you know, yet to be finally decided. Uh, we have indicated as a borough to Transport for London uh, that we will confirm our list. I think in, uh, after strategic committee approval on the seventeenth of March. So we have already submitted this uh, provisional list but on the on the understanding that it is it is a provisional list and TfL know that we have to go through uh, various committees such as this one this neighborhood one uh, in order to you know approve our, our final uh, our final list or rather our list preferences um, so uh, hopefully you will have seen uh, the the table that that goes with this report, I can bring it up on screen uh, as well to refer to, and also I can uh, also bring up on screen, uh, if you want, the sort of sketches that I've done, which focuses on four of the schemes which are south of the borough focused. Um, they being, um, if I'm just reading down the list, there's the Healthy Streets, Tolworth Road, Thornhill Road area. Uh, which is being led by my colleague 
Yunus Hamadi because he it, it's it's a scheme that cross that goes into Surbiton and North Kingston as well. So he's taking the lead on that. Uh, and there's also um, um, Cox Lane Mount Road Area Cycle Review, Clayton Road HGV issues, uh, Orchard Road Hunters Road. Uh, yeah, and I think those are the four. But there are also borough-wide schemes w w which will uh, have an impact on south of the borough, such as uh, the borough-wide 20 mile an hour uh, project um, uh, and uh, local transport fund, which is, uh, you know, general schemes. Um, not specific, but sort of more localised, more localised schemes. So... Um, so the the decision tonight then is to is to agree the uh the yeah is to agree the, the agree and prioritize the list that we have in the table um and any comments um from this committee we can forward to, for consideration to the um housing environment and planning committee on the 17th of march um and note that any adjustments required to the list, uh, should funding levels be reduced, uh, will be delegated to the um, Executive Director of Corporate Communities in consultation with the portfolio holder. So, um, would it help to bring up... Uh, yes, please. Say... That, that would be helpful. Thank you, Philip. And if anyone's got any questions, if you could put your name in the chat, because I won't be able to see your hands. Um, I think I've yep. got I've got Chris, <coughs> Margaret, okay. Steph. But if you yes, if you okay. could please, Phil. I'll need to uh, join twice, so don't be alarmed. <laughs> <laughs> um, just the, yes. Um, so if I while you're doing that um chris did you want to ask your first question yeah philip um i think it was november 2018 a small group of us met with transport for london in those days it was jasmine but also somebody from a more technical side of tfl who came out to a meeting that whole scheme of improvement <coughs> bridge road roundabout at the a243 has never been progressed further forward but it was seen as a high priority. So could this possibly be added to the prioritization list? Because it is really an important scheme. Um, well, uh, we, uh, we can certainly uh, make a note of it. The only thing about that, that location is that it's actually, um, it's, a t it's a TFL road, isn't it? Uh, so it would be TFL themselves, uh, in, in in cooperation and coordination with the borough that they, they would take a lead on any work on that on that roundabout I, um but certainly it, um i you know it can be highlighted with tfl uh, it again cleared into a black hole right yes i i recall you mentioning it before um and i, I did i did raise it but i can i can raise it again so so that wouldn't be a lip scheme as such for the purposes of this report, because this is a list of TFL funded borough schemes, but, but, but transport for London would take a lead on that, on that scheme. Um, but yes, but certainly in answer to your request, we can certainly raise it. Whoever, whoever leads on it and funds it. Yes. Thank you, Chris. Um, and then Margaret, please. Thank you. I mean, just to agree with what Chris said, actually, I've um, been talking about this to my certain knowledge for 10 years, <laughs> um, having meetings and site meetings and so on and so forth for a good 10 years now. However, that isn't really what I wanted to talk about. It's a Clayton Road, as you might guess. I would say that this has to be a priority. I don't know if you've seen the recent today's and yesterday's emails from residents who honestly are just desperate. You can barely walk down the road. You can't walk down a pavement on one side now because the HGVs and other lorries literally just carve it up. Each scaffolding just rattles through there, 
day after day after day, starting at five in the morning, finishing at 10 at night, causing huge disruption and massive, massive damage to the road. The curb, the curb has disappeared. The actual curb, the pavement curb has gone. It isn't there anymore. What there is is a huge, deep rut right down to the bed, bed of, the, of the road, of the pavement, that goes right across almost into the ditch and then back round again. I was driving through there the other day and I skidded quite badly just on the mud. And no, I wasn't skidding for once. No, I wasn't speeding and I just skidded on the mud. Um, and I just wanted to point out that the map, the little map you gave um, with the route of the HGV, pointing out uh, with, with it in a red dotted line, the route that the HGVs take, on the map, it says that they come up Woodstock Lane and up and into the Dell that way round. And it says that they come up Clayton Road, turn right into the old nursery site um, and back into the Dell and Five Acre Farm through there. That is wrong. They don't. From both directions, they come through the width restrictor. Time after time, day after day, they come through the width restrictor. Um, they come through the wrong side. They can only get through one side. So they just swap over and come through the wrong side. Again, the hazard potential is clear, clearly great. They managed to tow massive flatbed lorries lorry with dwellings on them, with great dwellings on the uh, prefabricated dwellings on them, up Clayton Road, causing a lot of damage to the road and the and the cars. And then somehow they managed to manoeuvre that through that um, through that width restrictor. I do understand that the fire engines, um, you had to discuss with the London Fire Brigade, but actually the London Fire Brigade have been going through there for donkey's years. I mean, I call them every so often because they burn tires over on the Dell, massive smoke pollution and so on. So call the fire brigade and it comes up Clayton Road and goes through there. I, you know, it's not impossible. So um, that has to be a priority. Our residents are just beside themselves with, with distress. And they keep pointing out to me, and they are right, that a width, if a width restriction anywhere else in the whole Royal Borough of Kingston was treated like that, it would not be. You know, it would not be permitted. Can you imagine that happening somewhere in Cambry, leading onto Cambry, the width restrictor leading onto Cambry Gardens? Because actually I can't. You know, it just wouldn't happen. And it really does have to stop. And it's the only way to stop is to remodel and just replace, replace what's been pulled up and destroyed on that width restrictor. I know it will need industrial quantities of concrete to stop it being dug up or pulled up. I know it's not going to be a terribly easy job, but it is absolutely crucial because the amount of heavy traffic we're getting up and down Clayton Road now, and especially as, as that was put there to stop that happening, and so there are speed bumps and these massive lorries, flatbed things with scaffolding and whatnot on them, go over the bumps on Clayton Road at a real lick and um, the noise and, again, the dust and so on for residents, it's not just occasional, it's all the time. And that, that width restrictor was um, removed when some work was done or altered when some work was done on the industrial estate and the um, equestrian centre to allow lorries through there, much to all of the south of the borough council's fury. That was permitted. That was a major mistake because that work was meant to go on for six months and it went on for 18. There were meant to be six lorry removals a day and I personally counted at least 25 on several occasions. And um, it was never replaced properly, which is what allows those massive lorries, HGVs and so on, to get through. So Thank please, you, Margaret. That's an absolute priority and I'm sorry to have gone on a bit, but it is just so important. Thank you, Margaret. I think that's on the on the list already, isn't isn't it, Philip? So it's just a matter of yes, and and, and just to uh, yes. Uh, yeah, hello, can you can you hear me? Yes, that's fine. Yeah, yeah. No, no just just to just to just to explain that um, the uh, yes, you, you, um, you're quite quite right, Councillor. The, the um, the point of uh, just highlighting where, where the HGV, HGVs go, uh, yes, they go through, but it was just to point out that they actually approach either side of the, the width restriction. So we have to consider what the nature of that restriction and, and if it's in that actually the right the right place. Um, that that was that was the that was the, um, the, the you know the, the intention of that to sh just to show that uh, we have to consider that the, 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 the HGVs are, are coming in both directions. 
Thank you, Philip. Um, okay, if I can then go to Steph, please. Um, thank you so much, Philip. Yeah, my camera's working. Um, can you just talk a bit more about the Cox Lane Mount Road area cycle review? <laughs> can I also just say it's really hard to see what you've put up. I don't know if anyone else is struggling. Uh, let me. Is it possible? Is it possible for us to just see the south of the borough schemes rather than yeah. everyone else's as well? Yes. Uh, can, uh, I don't know if you can see on screen um, the uh, the map I have there. Is that? Yes, can you we see can that? see that. Yeah. It's just. So, have, have you got a present mode that we can just so it can just take up the whole screen or not? On it's a word. Oh, um, it's it's actually a PDF rather than a. Yep. Let me just okay. see if. Um, Quite possibly. Let me just see. Um, mm, no, it doesn't look. Uh, okay, not to worry. That's okay. Don't worry. Okay, no, I'll, ju I'll just. It, it can be increased a bit more. Uh, ju just to. Uh, th these are the, not proposals. These are possibilities. Um, the th this. The, and this proposal is to it was basically to uh, continue um, cycle facilitation from what's currently on Jubilee Way, so that so that so that it um, facilitates cycling in and out of the, the south of the borough uh, along Jubilee Way and uh, and, and the Tolworth area. So um, there are, there are a number of po possible options here. Um, if if we do something on uh, uh, Cox Lane, we'd have to take into account, you know, the frontages of the uh, the industrial units there, because there's a, there's a lot of um, um, vehicle movements and parking along there. <clears throat> if we um, the Chantry Road alignments I've marked there, that's there's a possibility because um, Gilders Road, which is to the south of it, uh, is actually quite a wide road, and would be suitable for some sort sort of um, cycle facility, but we have to think about how uh, where the cycle route would continue north of that. So, for example, between Gilders Road and Chantry Road, there is a path, but we'd have to think about if, if it's wide enough or if it's if it's suitable or if any further work needs to be done. Um, and the 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 red dotted line there along uh, Mount Road um, takes into account the toucan that's currently being installed uh at the um uh at the at the uh the, the too many roundabouts there there's a there's a pedestrian crossing just there which is being upgraded right at the moment uh to a toucan which enables cyclists coming from the south uh to cross and go, go northwards um so so these so, so the, yeah so these are just highlighting some possibilities um Sorry, so um, if you don't mind me coming in. Yes. So you're proposing to cycle lane along Mount Road? Mm, uh, not well. Not, well I don't want to prejudge pre what, what, what it actually might be. It might be for Cox, that, for, that for Cox Lane, it might have to be something a bit more prominent. But it might be that for Tran Chantry Road or Mount, or Mount Road, you know, uh, you know Traffic calming may, may suffice. Um, Can I so, come in there, Philip? Come yes. In there, Philip. Okay. I yes. think um, the Cox um, Lane one. Thank you. Um, yeah, the, the Cox Lane one is there's there's an existing cycle lane there that is um, completely um, out of date and um, is unusual, is unusable because of cars that are parked on there because of the traffic management order, I think, that's on that, that place. It was on that area. So it was to try and look at doing a car. I think part of it, if I understand correctly, is to try and make it a continual cycle lane from the jubilee way one and to be able to use a cycle lane along cox lane um to make it safer for cyclists because at the moment the lay the cycle lane that is there is parked over 90 percent of the time and i think that's um i think that it was to look at the feasibility of whether anything could be done 
on that part. Is that correct, Phil? Did it? Yes, that's yes, that's right. Yes, yes. Does so that? Uh, Thank you. Does that question, answer your right? question, Steph? Steph. Uh, yes, it does. And um, I would just so hearing that this just sounds um, interesting. But also, I would just really echo what Margaret said that we are a top priority for us is sorting out that um, issue with HGVs and Clayton Road. So yes, yes, um, yeah. This, yeah. This sounds this yeah. sounds good, but I'd love for Clayton Road to be. Yep. Yep. Thank you, Steph and Chris. Would you like to come back in? Yeah, I I just have got strong reservations about your red dotted line because I'm just thinking of Roebuck, which has parks cars parked both sides of the road all the time. And then when we come further back down to Church Lane, yet again, it, we've got cars parked along one side completely, taking up the side of the lane. I just, it's too congested. I agree that um, Gilders is wide enough. Um, I'd really need to think more about that Chantry link because obviously you go up through that footpath, yes, which would yeah. have to be shared space. And I personally have strong reservations about shared space because they're not good for a lot of people. Um, cyclists are very good at shouting at people to get out of their way. But it is a case that the sh cyclists actually should be giving way to other people who are using the shared space. So I've got serious concerns about that as well. Yeah. I, uh, yeah. Well, as I say, these are not, no, you I know, they're, not they're not proposals. They're just... Uh, op yeah, op Possibly back to the drawing board. Yeah. Okay. Thank you, Philip. Um, so um, we've gone through any questions, and I just want to check if there's any other comments or anything that anybody wanted to make at all. No. Oh, no. Oh, oh, sorry. Um, so obviously, the other list that you um, sent through in terms of where, where double yellow lines um, are, are potentially going to come in and things like that, you sent that other list through. Um, yes, that's that. Yes, that's I was just going to ask. Um, I know we talked about a Clayton Road um, pedestrian crossing. Um, that's dropped off the list. Has, is there any reason for that? Is this the traffic? Sorry. Is this a, the traffic? Traffic. Yes, it's the. Yes. It's, yeah. Okay. Can we leave that till later when you continue with the, the item? Yes, yeah, fine. Yeah, that's absolutely fine. Okay. Thank you. Um, so um, I've um, listed out the the main comments that have come out this evening is to ensure that Clay um, is definitely on that list and is um, a priority, please. Um, I didn't really have anything else to add on to it apart from to ask you individually to, to separately to speak to TFL regarding Bridge Road, um, bridge, well, the roundabout. So um, um, I, so if I've pointed though the Clayton Road as prioritised and um, we'll note that to be forwarded to the Culture, Housing, Environment and Planning meeting, SHEP, um, on March 17th. Um, so does anyone else want anything to be added? Are you happy with those points I've listed? Okay, um, so if we've agreed that um, on those comments and recommendations on page B1, um, I think that's, um, we'll pass those through if that's all right, Philip, is that agreed? Yes, Unanimously? Lovely. Okay. Thank you very much indeed, committee. Um, so if we go to item 11, and that's the school streets um, and Mansfield Road, um, which is there's an experimental traffic management order as part of the school streets initiative. Um, and I'll pass back to Philip um, to introduce the item. Thank you. Thank you, Philip. Okay. Uh, thank you, Chair. <coughs> Bear with me, I'll just uh, br bring up the uh, report for myself. <laughs> and I, I've just notified my colleague, uh, uh, Pat Long, that uh, so he, he'll be, he'll hopefully be joining us shortly. Thank you. So, um, so, um, so uh, this item, Mansfield Road Review of Experimental Traffic, traffic Management Order. Um, 
so th this is a, 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 the, the, f a, the first school street scheme uh, in Kingston. Um, a school streets being uh, a, a scheme whereby motor traffic is restricted uh, on the school drop-off and picking up hours during term time to um, to improve the environment for uh, for, for children going to the school, for, for pedestrians, for parents taking their children to school, improving road safety, uh, air quality, uh, and to encourage more walking uh, and cycling to school. And also in this particular location, uh, local residents were having problems with uh, parking in the local area uh, along Mansfield Road and the, and the three cul-de-sacs that come off them. Um, so it was it was to resolve those issues. Uh, it was it was done on a, an experimental traffic management order basis, which is a, um, a temporary uh, a temporary order, which lasts for eighteen months. The first six months of which uh, people uh, is a formal um, formal consultation period, whereby people can uh, submit. Um, objections to the notice uh, but but uh, the sustainable transport team also encouraged um, parents and local residents to comment on the scheme anyway through the uh, using the let's talk portal and sending out uh, letters to residents in the local area um, now as I say this is a an 18th month 18 month trial scheme uh, and we're the the report is asking members to um to uh having reviewed the um, the, the the comments in the report is to resolve to to make permanent the traffic management order um also to po point out to, uh, to members that um it has to be done if we if we if we are if we if you are minded to make it permanent uh it has to to be done at this meeting otherwise uh it, it, the uh yeah the, the the current experimental order will expire and we'd have to yeah uh look to either start it again or think about how to how to go forward so uh a, d a decision either way is is required uh, at, at this meeting um so it's been um in terms of a uh, the effect it's been well received by uh par by parents uh children and teachers at the school i don't know if you've seen a promotional video that the school produced but it's certainly been well received by uh parents in the school uh who seem to indicate that it's had a very transformative effect uh on their experience of going to school um and also Local residents who live within the zone have indicated that uh, the, the, there's been a positive effect for them. So, um, so in in that respect, the scheme I would say has been a, a success. Um, there are uh, s things to consider, such as displacement of parking. Uh, a, um, a few residents have fed back to us uh, that there have been. An increase in parking that was there before, but it, but it's increased both to the north of Mansfield Road and to the south. Now, um, our sustainable transport team has made an arrangement with the King Centre, which is to the south of Mansfield Road, that parents could park in their car park, you know, for free, without any restriction, um, and, and walk their children to school from the car park. And... Again, uh, officers have liaised with the school to um, uh, distribute um, information ab about that free parking to to parents via the school's uh, communication network. Um, so, and also we've notified enforcement officers where necessary to step up enforcement as as necessary where there have been reports of uh, um, you know issue, issues uh, with parking problems. So. Um, so, the, the, so the, so the, any parking issues, any parking issues are being monitored, but overall, I think the scheme has been has been uh, a success. Um, 
And we don't know how long that situation, how long that displacement will last for. It may be that people uh, get used to the the scheme and, um, you know, uh, do, do slightly different things so that it, so that the scheme settles down. But but we are we are uh, keeping keeping an eye on it, and we'll take uh, whatever relevant you know whatever relevant uh, action is required to resolve that. Um, so uh, a, th a total of uh, if I just yes, yeah, so a total of nine hundred letters were sent out to local residents, um, and we've had. 22 responses via the Let's Talk portal. Uh, that's over 2% of that 900. Um, it's difficult to assess to what extent those 22 responses are representative of everybody as a whole, but many of those responses were about were highlighting the displacement, displaced parking issues that are highlighted. Uh, so we, we've got a list of where they are, what the, what kind of issues they are, and as I say, we're, we're keeping an eye on it and seeing how... Uh, you know how the situation develops as we as we as we go on, um, and of course, should should the scheme become permanent, we you know we will continue to uh, work at trying to resolve them. Uh, you know w w whatever those options may be, um, and as I say, um, the, uh, we do have to make a decision on it. Uh, well, if we want to make it permanent, we have to make that decision tonight. Uh, it would be my my comment if the uh, if if members are minded to do so. Um, shall I? Hopefully, I don't know if my Thank colleague you, Pat, uh, if my if my colleague Patrick is on the line, but uh, yes, he's he's here. He's Good here. evening, okay. Patrick. So I'll open this up to um, questions and comment, comments, if I may. Um, so I've got um, Chris up first, please. Thank you, Chris. Yeah, apologies. I feel so um, I'm a damp squib on this. I'm really delighted that you entered into negotiation with the King Centre, first of all, for parking for school. And I think that was really enlightened and really good. The negative side was being proactive in making certain that parents did not park on local streets. And although you only had 22 results, uh, responses, I know that for Arnold Drive, you must have a petition which has got all the householders apart from three. Now that in itself would be more than 22. So although you've got 22 responses, you've actually got responses from all those people. Now, that's a very significant number from one particular road. And I was really disheartened yesterday that the road was physically blocked as a result of the parking. There is a very vulnerable resident on that road who frequently needs ambulance service to reach them. And there is serious concern about this. Now, this morning, I did send an email at the suggestion of the chair. And sure enough, parking enforcement were down there at the end of the day. And lo and behold, there was no problem. And this has been my argument, that if we had a visible presence, parents would have got the message that a very short distance away, for free, they could park safely and conveniently. And there just has not been enough proactive work done on that. And I am really saddened by that. Thank Shall you, I... Chris. Yes, please, Philip. Yes. Pat may want to uh, say something as well, but um, well, um, council officers, including Pat, ha as I say, have um, been in constant dialogue with the school about get, you know getting the message out to parents to do with par you know about where to park and, and about considerate parking, um, and where and, and where um, enforcement has had to be stepped up. Uh, you know, we have taken action on that, including t today from from your. Uh, email councillor about Arnold Drive and indeed uh, officers have in the past um, been out on Arnold Drive to to uh, uh, messaging drive messaging parents who have parked there um, when, when you say um, a petition is I take it this is a petition to do with parking is it or to do with having some form of parking control is that I was hoping you'd know more about it because I I know it was submitted so perhaps Patrick would have more knowledge about it. 
because I actually asked specifically about it and only three residents could not be contacted to actually sign it, but all the others had. Patrick, did you want yeah. to come in? Yeah, so we received a petition uh, a while ago. So uh, the scheme's obviously been running since October 2019. And uh, more recently, we've worked with um, the residents um, and the, the, the local councillors, obviously, to try and work with the residents of Arnold Drive to see what we could do. Um, we've ended up um, creating leaflets for the drivers. Um, and it's what what we find is that it's always the the same sort of characters that go there and park in the in in the place, despite <coughs> the centre being on the other side of the road. Um, and and Lovelace and Mansfield Road, it's it's a unique situation. It, like you won't find another car park that that we will let, we will be able to use for any other school street. Um, and yet, the parents will still park right next door. It's it's, it's really the same thing. It's, it's the same it, distance, isn't it? It's, yeah. I, it, it can't be any more than sort of 30, 40 yards walking. Um, so, yeah, we are, I mean, we, we do try and, uh, you know, get the, the, the school to remind parents constantly. I've been down to specifically Arnold Drive and the back as well um, with the head teacher and the deputy head teacher to see the issues. Um, they obviously know that the, that there's displacement as well, and so they do keep on reminding parents in the newsletters, in uh, text messages, in um, so many different ways on their website. Um, but you're still going to find those one or two parents that will want to park as close as possible. Um, and even on the start of Coppard Gardens, where you've got those five or six spaces just before the double yellow lines, it's a it's a race to get to those parking spaces um so yeah we keep on trying and keep on pushing and um reminding these drivers i think we could go and um maybe um leaflet these drivers again um and i've been told that the ceos are going to be down there uh, over the next couple of days as well um so we'll see how it goes um i have had an email from the ceo and the, and he was saying that um it might have because he was down there. It um, he didn't he didn't turn up and it was pandemonium. He was there for quite a while. He looked um, and his comment was maybe the Monday was a, a you know it's the first day back. It was particularly busy, um, but obviously we don't know. It's quite difficult from one day to the next. We don't know what the situation is. So hopefully, and um, the CEO can come back to us over the next few days and let us know if there's any more. Um, major issues, really. I suspect that parents seeing the CEO will actually go elsewhere. Yeah, yeah. Well, that's that's what I think as well. Um, he did go. So I've been a number of times, and I did send them around from uh, two fifty ish. He didn't get there till about three ten, um, and usually around that time, most of the cars would have parked by then. Um, and would have gone to collect their kids. So uh, I have got photos and I can share them. It doesn't seem particularly busy, but obviously that I think there are one or two cars that aren't residents there. Um, they're definitely going to be um, parents or carers. Um, but I can update anybody who wants to remain updated. Thank you, Patrick. Um, okay, so I will move to Andreas, please. Thank you, Chair, and thanks, uh, Patrick and uh, Philip. And uh, I think, uh, like Philip initially mentioned, overall it seems to be a, a success, and it's the first one in Kingston, and I'm pleased it's in Chessington, and that it's overall by parents, teachers, uh, and um, also the residents in the zone uh, welcome mostly. And also, again, uh, I'm really grateful for the offer, generous offer from the King Center. Uh, but I really don't want to drag this on longer, but reiterate basically what Chris has said, Christina has said, uh, if we really can take this serious, uh, the misplacement issues for those residents affected, and if we can keep up the vigilance, and uh, uh, if, we, if we are minded to make it permanent tonight, that we really 
uh, monitor the situation closely and try to 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 really help these residents who are affected. So, because there obviously has the overall positive uh, impact and benefit, but we shall not just leave those who are negatively affected alone. So, if we can monitor the situation, please really uh, and uh, try to 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 help those residents, and especially obviously in Arnold Drive and also Coppard Gardens, then we, we we give them the support they they are they deserve in order to get this positively sorted. Yeah. Thank you, Andreas. Um, Margaret, would you like to come in? Thank you. I do wonder what it was with the 50s and 60s planners that built pretty much all our schools this end of the borough at the end of a cul-de-sac. <laughs> they obviously thought it would be safer for children because nobody would drive to school or be so few cars driving. But my concern, I have had a lot of emails and, and so on and, and communications from people who live in Devon Way, at the back entrance to the school. There's a huge amount of displacement parking there because people who might otherwise have used the front, front entrance are going around to the back. And um, I think that, um, I mean, the back entrance is essentially a cul-de-sac because, uh, because of the block to Stormont Way. So I, am very, I do wonder if it, the, the school street could even be extended so that Devon Way was actually part of it, or at least the, um, up to the um, junction with Newlands, Newlands Way. If there was some kind of, or if there was some kind of way of making parents go one way in the loop around Newlands Way and back out again, that would also help. But of course there isn't, and they all pile up to the end of, of Devon Way and then try and turn round, try and reverse into the drive that actually leads down to the school, although they're asked not to. And that causes massive problems and it's incredibly dangerous for the children trying to walk into the back entrance. It's really frightening to see what happens there. So, um, I do think that the particular problem with displacement parking is at the rear entrance to the school. And it would be really good if something, um, even if the school street could be increased to include the back entrance. Thank you. Thank you, Margaret. Um, did Philip or Patrick want to come back in on that one, on that suggestion? Well, yes, the, um, extending the school street is an idea that's being, uh, is one possibility that is being considered. Um, uh, but yes, we're, we're, but yes, we are aware of um, what, what's happening um, along Devon Way and Stormont Way. So, but uh, but yes, so it, it, we have yeah we haven't decided yet exactly because we we want to see how how what happens in the short to medium term as well. Uh, so so inside what we you know what's a proportionate response, but but certainly extending the school street has been an idea that's been uh, discussed. Residents have told me that actually, oh, sorry, Chair, do you mind if I come back? Please, please do, yeah. Residents have told me that um, they, they feel that the displacement parking has worsened as more and more parents who would have parked in Mansfield originally just come round to the back. In fact, they, they end up driving much further than they would need to walk, actually, but they just drive round to the back instead of... Um, instead of parking in the in the um in the, in the king center and residents have told me that 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 that, um, that the displacement parking and the problems with turning have increased also some parents try to get through the restricted to get onto Stormont way and that in itself causes massive problems as well so thank you Margaret. okay wonderful okay and well um steph would you like to come in Hello, yes. Well, I'll declare an interest here, being a lovely mum myself and walking in the Devon Way entrance every day and um, just the absolutely outrageous parking that goes on and the idling. So, like, my children are walking to school and just breathing in lots of noxious fumes. Um, I would absolutely love to see the school street extended to Devon Way. That would be superb. I'd also would say that Arnold Drive isn't quite 30 to 40 yards from the King Centre car park. Once you've walked all the way around, it's it's a further walk. So that's why I'm so excited about this potential for a, a path at the top of the RAF Chesington, because I think that would provide a huge incentive for people to actually use the car park, because actually parents are feeling like, do you know what? Feel it's quite a long walk. I mean, it's not, but it's quite it's a, it's a longish walk from the King Centre car park. 
Um, so that's why so many people are doing this on-street parking. Uh, another alternative possibility, could you extend the WLA lines as well along Coppard Gardens? I guess that would um, worsen things for guys in Arnold Drive. Um, and I would echo again, can we please have traffic wardens regularly there and at Devon Way? Um, please, just and at, at actual times when it will help rather than a little bit too late. Um, so that would just be my comment. Thank you very much. Oh, one last thing I would say is that, um, another, on the other side of the coin is actually because Lovelace is a three form entry school, um, it does actually have children from kind of all over the area. So there are parents who I do sympathise with driving because it's not one of those schools where everyone lives kind of within, you know, 500 metres. We do have people who do come from across Chesington. So there is sympathy there for, for parents and carers who do need to drive. Thanks. Thank you, Steph. Um, okay, so um, I will um, move this from the chair. Um, do I have a second of that, please? Thank you, Steph Archer, Councillor Archer. Thank you very much. Um, so, can we agree on the recommendations on page C one? Okay, that's lovely. So that's um, so we've agreed that unanimously. So uh, I think you have your decision, Philip, to to move thank, that forward. Thank you. Thank you. Okay, so now we'll go on to item twelve: objections to disabled bay in Hartfield Road, Chessington. Um, so we now turn to consider the objections to the traffic management order, which <coughs> included proposals for new disabled bays in Hartfield Road, Chessington. Again, I'll pass back to Philip um, to introduce the item. Thank you. Thank you, Chair. Yes, so this is um, essentially, this is, uh, uh, yeah, so it's, it's an application for a disabled parking bay uh, in Hartfield Road uh, outside numbers um, 74 to 76. Hopefully you've seen the uh, plan there where, where the location is. Um, and we've had uh, uh, th uh, three objections to the to, uh, to the disabled parking bay. Um, now, uh, ordinarily, well, the, the the council has a the standard uh, position is that the council has a duty of care uh, to provide uh, the disabled parking bay, as long as, of course, the application. Uh, as you know, the assessed application you know meets uh, the relevant criteria, uh, and if that that's met and it's uh, it's all bona fide, that then um, we are obliged to we have a duty to provide a disabled parking bay. Um, there's no theoretical, there's no uh, limit as such on the number of parking bays, um, and if the if the need is there, then we we have to provide it. It's not. Or it's not automatic. Uh, there, 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 there can be situations where it's uh, for reasons of, you know, safety or, or whatever to do with the position of the bay that, that they're not provided. But if, if but ordinarily, uh, we we will we will provide them, and we recommend that uh, objections based on purely on, um, you know, c c capacity to do with parking are set aside uh, because if anything that means that uh, people with physical disabilities sh should have priority if there are such problems. Um, the, 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 I think in, in a couple of the objections that they commented on um, the fact that there seem to be quite or that there are currently uh, four disabled parking bays there and I did look into that um, uh, but the, and the reason seems to be that uh, that section of Hartfield Road at the top is is uh, belongs to uh, uh, Royal Borough of Kingston housing, and some of that housing is actually allocated for. Um, if I just if you just bear with me, uh, just looking at the precise wording, yeah. So uh, s some of them are. Um, uh, some of the households are uh, adult social care service users uh, and a couple of uh, 
a couple of whom are known to have physical disabilities. So there does seem to be uh, a need for disabled parking bays in that section of Hartfield Road right at the top. So that's why there are uh, that number of disabled parking bays. So, um, um, so my, the, the, what I'm recommending is that uh, the objections are set aside uh, and that we install the disabled parking bay. Thank you, Philip. I'll now open this up to um, to committee. Um, if I can start with Chris, please. She's getting quick on that buzzer and getting those, <laughs> those fingers going tonight. Thank you. I never knew that parking was a hot potato for me. Um, it's really a disability champion, Philip, I'm asking here. Has it been checked out that the people to whom those disabled bays were originally assigned are still resident? I, I, ha I have pursued that line of inquiry, yes. Um, uh, with, with the uh, officer who deals with, um, you know, TMOs and disability parking bays, um, and as far as we can, as far as we know, uh, that th they are still they are still needed. Uh, but I did I did follow that I did check that line of inquiry just to make sure that they were uh, still needed. What usually happens, I'm told, is that uh, um, the council will be. In, uh, ask, well, if if residents notice that it's not being used, uh, you know it's not being used as a disabled parking bay. Then apparently, uh, we get feedback from other residents on that. So that's that's one way that. Uh... But my understanding, Philip, is that a parking bay is assigned specifically to an individual. Now it okay. Sometimes you then get a number passed on it. But the point is, the person has to meet that criteria. Yes, yes. That person moves. Yes. Even though somebody else comes in who might be disabled, they may not meet the requirements. And that's what I'm saying. Have those yes. requirements been really strictly checked? You, um, uh, uh, yeah, I'm sure they have. It's, um, um, yes, there, 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 there's... Um, there's an application form on the on the website which uh, they have to fill in certain details. The officer checks those details. Um, so yes, yeah, so they they are they are checked. Um, but, Thank but, but, you. Yeah. Thank you, Philip. I think yeah, I think that's one of the things is it, it's very difficult sometimes, and I know we identified it in the meeting um, a couple of weeks ago. Um, having to having these checked to make sure that they are still being used, and there are those sufficient numbers in in that area that actually needs need those spaces. So, <coughs> thank you, Chris. Okay, so I'll go to if I can open it up to Margaret now, please. Thank you. Thank you. I remember about 10 or 11 years ago when the first application for disabled parking bay was put in and residents objected to that one. Then, <laughs> So this is not, not new. Um, but what I wanted to say is that firstly, on the map you sent, it wasn't possible to actually see where the parking bays, well, I couldn't see exactly where the parking bays were. I said, fine, I know Hartfield Road, so I can kind of imagine, but I'm, I'm not 100% sure. Um, but the other thing was that one of the objections that was raised was one of the objectors said that there that somebody was going to have two parking bays for two cars. That, I'm sure that's not happening. I yes, I did. I did raise that with the, with the um, officer who deals with the table parking bays, and he he said that's not. Uh, we did discuss that that point raised. Uh, he said it's not. Um, uh, but it's not. Uh, it's not relevant to the application, uh, is, is the upshot of what he said. Um, but does that, so does that mean you can have two parking bays if you've got two cars, if you're just... Because you need two oh. single badges there, which you can't have, so that can't be, that can't be right. Um, it, it's, uh, it's, it's one, and as I understand it, it's one bay um for for the household yeah that's what i understood but just because that had been raised i just wanted to double check that we weren't inadvertently doubling up 
That's no, I did, I, I did specifically raise that with with the with the officer concerned. So, but he said no. That's not, you know, that's. Thank you, Margaret. Sharon. Thank you. I agree with your recommendations, Philip. I live on Hartfield Road at number 63, so I'm further along the end where the um, the bungalows are. And it is a road that has a lot of traffic on it. There are an awful lot of cars down Hartfield Road. There are also an awful lot of houses that have driveways and dropped curbs. So there's a lot of driveway parking and not much on-road parking. And the on-road parking there is at the end with the bungalows um, is, is a busy area. It's a small area. I think the issue with Hartfield Road and Chesington in general is that a lot of families have been there for many years. We've got growing up children who are living at home and have their own cars. So a lot of the households um, have two, three, or even four cars. In Chesington, there are also a lot of um, vans. So many of the houses on my road will have a car, a, a boat, and a van, a work van, to park either on their front drive or not on their front drive. Um, and it seems that vans attract other vans. So there are a lot of vans and vehicles on my road. Um, now I know pretty much all the residents in the bungalows in Hartfield Road. And last year I did work with one household to get them a disabled parking bay. And they had a very real need because they were using mobility scooters and often weren't able to park in their road. They had to park two or three roads along um, and then, yeah, get back to their house. Uh, I've noticed that the young, normally men who drive the lorries and the vans are physically able and have physically demanding jobs. And therefore, I think it's OK that they park their van in the next road and walk through one of the alleys or, as sometimes happens, park their vans in the alleys behind Hartfield Road. Um, so it's not very much more of an effort. Um, I, I can see that uh, I get your point, Chris, that you, you raise sometimes people's needs change and you don't want to have uh, a group of disabled bays that aren't being used. Um, and I know that at least two of the households have elderly, vulnerable residents who don't drive, but may want to be picked up or, or dropped home by someone who may drive. Um, but I can say that the other parking spaces that are used are needed. And I do think the needs of our uh, disabled residents must come first. So thank you. Thank you, Sharon. Um, anyone else got any comments at all that they'd like to make? OK, thank you very much. Um, I'll move this from the chair. Do I have a seconder for that, please? And can I pass that to Councillor Stewart? Thank you very much. Um, and can we agree on the recommendations on page D1? Lovely, that's unanimous. So thank you very much. Um, thank you, committee. Um, we'll go to item 13, urgent items authorised by the chair. There's no urgent items, um, but I then we'll go on to item 14, which is for information items. Um, can I first check the committee have seen the late material for the item? Okay, I'll pass over to Sunny from Highways and Transport to update the committee on this information item. Welcome, Sunny. I think it's probably the first time you've been to South of the Borough, so so welcome um, to this distant part of the of uh, the Royal Borough of Kingston. Um, now I'll pass over to you. Thank you. Thank you, Chair. Uh, yes, this is my first time, and actually, the first time I see some of the faces here. I've been emailing some of some of the councillor in the past, but actually seeing face to face today. Uh, this is quite a simple item, really. This is just for information item. Uh, as you can see, what we have here is a uh, a list of road, carriageway, and footway that officer have um, identified as. Um, basically beyond the econ economical repair for the ad hoc uh, repair, you know, like a few square meter here and there. 
So we need to have an investment on what we want is to do a full reconstruction on the footway and full resurfacing on the carriageway with the capital money that we allocated to us every year. And you can see from the list that there's a few roads in south of the borough there that we have selected. And uh, basically, uh, hopefully that the committee will make a note of, of the information item and any comments, we will be taking it to the uh, to the uh, to the strategic, you know, the chief committee on the 17th for approval. Uh, any comment will be verbally report back at the committee on the night uh, on the 17th. And um, if there's any questions, I will try to answer, you know, tonight. And if I couldn't answer any question, I will take it away and email the councillor direct or, or or anything that uh, you can throw at me. Thank you very much. Thank you, Sonny. I think Steph, you had did you have something on that list that you wanted to bring forward? Thank you. Yes. Hello. Um I was just wondering, Sonny, I had um met with Philip um I think a couple of years back about a uh, pedestrian crossing on Clayton Road. Um and just wondering whether or not that could be re-added into that list. Uh no, basically this list is <laughs> as easy as that. I mean, we can look at it for next financial year, which is 2022 20, and 23. This financial year, we have basically what we have been allocated is about 1.5 million pounds, and for the whole, you know, borough, that list is already been committed. Uh, I mean, if you want to replay Clayton, then we have to take one of these road off your list in south of the borough uh, or we will have you have to wait into next year then we can uh, i mean i can contact you directly outside and then we can have a look at clayton which road and from where to where you think is really bad that we need to concentrate on doing the full resurfacing then we can do it that way but if you want to replace it you know that that is your the committee decision. Uh, you can take one of the road off, and then we can use the money to do Clayton, uh, if you if the committee wish. Lovely to have someone just so straightforward with an answer there, Sonny. That's wonderful. I mean, I, I, yes. I mean, thank you, Chair. I mean, I can't promise that yes, yes, I'm going to do, it, but we haven't got the money to do them. You know. <laughs> <laughs> thank you, Steph. Did you want to come back at all? Um, I've I. I appreciate your straight talking. I, I do like that. Um, reluctantly, um, okay, we'll look at it for 22, 23. Um, yeah, we'll just need to make sure that kind of is put on the next list. I, I make a note of this and then I will contact you, um, you know, and then we can have a survey together or we can have a look. I mean, if you want, we can have a look ourselves and I can email you directly and say, yes, we think it's quite urgent and we will add it onto the priority list for future year, which is next year or something. You know. Fantastic. Let, let's do that. That would be really lovely. Thanks. Okay, thank you. Thank you. Margaret, did you want to come in? Thank you. Actually, I was going to say, because we've been asking for this uh, zebra crossing on um, Clayton Road for, for some years as well. And if, if we're going to be looking at the, um, at last, looking at the width restrictor on Clayton Road, and that might be moved, that might be a good thing, good time to look at them both in conjunction with each other because they go together. However, um, so that I think is, is really quite important. But what I was going to ask, Sunny, is uh, the Mount Road resurfacing. We have had complaints from residents for a very long time about the bit of Mount Road that goes from the little roundabout beyond Chantry Road, the little roundabout where the road turns right, that sharp right angle bend, and then the turning left. Um, there's a short area over a short, very short length of road that goes down to Four Oaks Hostel. Um, and that bit of road, that little bit of road there, is in bad condition. And we've had a number of residents actually fall, hurt themselves and fall over. And there's one elderly gentleman who won't go out now because um, because he's he's fallen or, you know, he's a bit fragile and uh, he's almost fallen or has fallen on a number of occasions. And we have been asking for that bit of road, if possible, to be looked at, the pavement to be resurfaced. The road surface isn't wonderful either, to be honest. But I think because it's a small roundabout and cars go around it actually often too fast. 
and also because it's a, a little cul-de-sac ending in four mm. and cars go down there and then turn around and come back and often in little cul-de-sacs you get a lot of wear mm. and cars have reversed or turned around and come back so could, would it be possible to look at that li- it's only a little bit of road it's it really is from the roundabout down to four oaks um and just look at well and it's a pavement more than the road can i can i come please do sonny yes uh yeah mount road that we identify just the carriageway resurfacing uh not, not the footway but if you want me to go and have a look at the footway where you mentioned, then I can certainly have a look at it, but I cannot promise you that any plan work will carry on. But we can obviously make it safe, you know, uh, through ad hoc repair, small patches here and there, you know. Uh, you know, we have a duty of care. You know, we don't want any pavement that have trip, slip and fall. So by all means, I mean, after this, uh, next week, I will send you an email. You tell me exactly where the location is. I will promise you that we'll have a look. And then if necessary, we will raise a, a couple of works or the, you know, to make it safe, you know. So so the gentleman that you mentioned, we're quite happy to, to walk about, you know, uh, in the area. If that's okay with you, then I will do that. That's just brilliant, Sunny. Thank you so much. Thank you. Thank, thank you, Sunny. Andrea, oh, Andrea, she did that in, in error. That's fine. Um, did anyone else have any questions at all of Sunny or Philip? No, yeah, the, no, just, yes, so, just, yes. just, just to say that um, the, 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 uh, the Clayton Road crossing is not really a, a maintenance issue uh, for Sunny. Um, it's, it's, a, it's a new scheme, so it's more to do with us, really. Um, but, I, but if we're going to move on to the next item, then I'll, I'll mention, I'll mention or should I, I just yes, mention it then? Yes, please go ahead. Yeah, no, you can, I think you can go ahead um, well, and... Because um, it, yeah. it was, the, the Clayton Road crossing uh, was listed under our RBK funded schemes, which um, which is not LIP or S106. It's, uh, I suppose that's the equivalent to in uh, the list of possible funding we've got there, possibly local transport fund or or some other fund so it's not so it's a question of what we're going to fund with the money that we're going to get for next year and where uh, you know a zebra crossing or whatever crossing we decide to go for if we do on clayton road where uh, it's the same 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 as the lip we, it's a question of where that lies in the and the priority in the priorities for the funding that we're going to have such as it is for, for next financial year so it so um you've got it on it, a list though have you philip so you're you're aware yeah. of it yes no it's 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 on our <laughs> we have we we have our uh, a list of you know all, all the schemes and its status but basically it's just a um really it's awaiting funding really lovely thank you very much indeed okay well um i think if we finished all the updates um, and any information, Philip, did you have anything else you wanted to add at all? Um, well, j j just uh, um, you, you would have had the traffic schemes update as well. So um, if there are any questions from that, I can try and answer. But if not. OK. Anyone, anyone has any questions at all? That's lovely. Oh, Sharon, oh. yes. Just, just, sorry, just, just, sorry. Just to point out, I've just had a message through. Uh, apparently, the the Clayton Road scheme crossing uh, would be li would be lip. It would be, <laughs> it lip, would be lip funding. It would be, it would be lip funding. But again, it's so subject can, to it's subject to funding priorities. So can we make sure that's on um, a list to be um, considered when the next lip funding program mm. comes up? Um, so yes. we can decide whether or not it's something we want to to proceed with as a committee. That could... Yes. Yeah. Lovely. Thank you very much. Sharon. Yeah, I wonder if I speak for us all here when I say that we would like as much done as quickly as possible, as high priority as possible. I know you don't have a magic wand and an endless pot of money, but um, it would be really good to have some of the things we've talked about moved forward. Thank you. 
Thank you, Sharon. I, yes, I do think you speak for all of us. So thank you very much. Um, and thank you, Sunny and Philip, for, for coming along this evening. Um, I've just got one quick update before we close <laughs> the meeting, if that's all right. Um, uh, Colin Swan, um, our local sergeant, contacted us, just wanted me to apologise to the committee. Um, unfortunately, due to a last minute shift change, he was unable to attend, but uh, hopefully he'll be at our next meeting. Um, so, um, in that case, I will go ahead and close the meeting at 9.40. Um, thank you, everyone, for this evening. Um, good night and stay safe. Take care. Good thank night. you. Good night. Good night. Good night. Good night.